the famous bridge in Nanking is an engineering marvel the Chinese point to with pride. Many Westerners had said it would be impossible to build. But in China today, there is the sense everywhere that the impossible is impossible no more. Dare to think, dare to act, exhorted the late chairman Mao Zedong. Guided by his thoughts rather than their own, the Chinese have embarked for a brave new world. There are nearly a billion people in the People's Republic of China. What China is today and what she will become are very much in the hands of the masses. Most of China's millions, 90% in fact, live in the easternmost sixth of the nation. Many live in the great crowded cities of the East Coast. The task of feeding China's huge population has always been a difficult one. In a land where grim famines have killed millions, the getting and consuming of food is still a serious business. There is neither feast nor famine in China today. With enough to eat for everyone, the Chinese have been able to devote some of their energy to industry. Industrialization is an official goal, but official goals and projections are not always fulfilled. The Great Leap Forward, for example, fell short of its goals. In truth, while scattered mills and plants stamp out their products with mechanized efficiency, many others hearken back to the dawn of Western industrialization. To speed up the process of industrialization and modernization, China imports foreign technology. The steel-making complex at Wuhan is a large facility begun by Soviet technicians and completed by the Chinese. Plants like this one signify that China is capable of independent achievement, that at long last, she is beginning to catch up with the rest of the industrial world. While the Soviet Union is physically a much larger country, the People's Republic of China is the most populous nation in the world. China today is an important international power. But for thousands of years, the vast empire of China existed in nearly total isolation from all but its nearest neighbors. To keep the barbarians from the north out of the most advanced civilization on earth, a wall was constructed. A great wall more than 2,000 kilometers long. It stood between four and a half and nine meters high and was five and a half meters wide at the top, a formidable barrier against outsiders. And what were these ancient Chinese protecting? Their country first an almost magical land of jagged, soaring mountains and picturesque villages clinging to steep hillsides. But the people who ordered the Great Wall built were protecting more than their land. They were jealously guarding a way of life. Splendid hats, robes, and belts were permitted the mandarins, the officials who govern China. For the privileged, existence was a pursuit of refined pleasures, scholarship, painting, and poetry. In the eyes of the artist, even work like raising silkworms whose fibrous cocoons would be used in weaving silk, even hard work takes on a quality of timeless tranquility. For the nobles, for the wealthy, life was filled with diversions.
Sometimes the vision of the well-to-do artists of long ago is captured again by the motion picture camera. In the 1920s and 30s, camera operators were able to record on film what the old artists had painted on paper and silk. But the more objective camera recorded other truths as well. Incalculable hunger and poverty, shameful living conditions, inhuman crowding. It was the story the artists never painted and the poets never sang. A life of grinding poverty and for many, unrelieved misery. By the 20th century, even for those few who could read, the news was not good. For the Chinese peasant, long work, little pay, a life of resigned sadness. But for the very wealthy, for the increasingly prevalent and powerful foreigner, a life of luxurious indulgence. Chief symbol of the old way of life was the forbidden city in Peking, exclusive home of the emperor or empress and the highest officials. Ordinary Chinese were forbidden to enter here, Foreigners were forbidden to photograph. Finally, the poverty and the privilege could coexist no longer. The last dynasty crumbled, and in 1912, the last emperor abdicated. Chaos reigned as powerful men with grand visions struggled for supremacy. It was in this cave dwelling in Yan'an that the man who would win hid from his enemies. Today the cave and everything in it are a shrine to the Chinese revolution. Mao Zedong and the survivors of the Long March came to Yan'an to escape from Chiang Kai-shek. Here, safe from Chiang's aircraft, the communists rebuilt their strength and plotted to win a nation. It was in this cave, with time to reflect, that Mao wrote many of the works that would structure a new government and shape Chinese thought for years to come. Forces and ideas that had been colliding and changing for years found a focus and a voice in this man. Two leaders, Mao Zedong and his comrade in arms, Zhou Enlai, look out from the dwelling where modern China was born. The geographic variety of China could hardly be better demonstrated than by journeying from the mountainous region around Yan'an to the watery region around Hangzhou. The greatest density of Chinese railway mileage is in the northeast. But China's railway system is reaching ever farther toward the far-flung outposts of this vast country. On long trips, the train becomes a self-contained world, with the passenger's comfort a prime concern. Appetizing food is prepared in an efficient galley and consumed at tables with a window on the world outside. Rest and relaxation take their place in the course of each day's journey. Until recently, Relatively few Chinese traveled on the railroads. Special visas were needed just to go from one city to another. Now, however, the government has eased travel restrictions.
From the horizon, the rice paddies reach all the way up to the railroad tracks, an indication of how intensively the Chinese must cultivate what little arable land they have. In the summer, many Chinese prefer to live outdoors, even in the cities. Chinese fishermen are organized into groups called production teams. Here, south of the Yangtze River in the east, fishermen work a tidal lake. Using a large net, the fish are carefully pulled toward the shore. The team's catch is sold to the state. In areas like this one, water is everywhere, and its influence pervades every aspect of life. The result is a view of an older China, one that has changed little. Here, many people actually live on the water, their boats being both shelter and transportation. The government has changed much in China, but even the government cannot change the face of the water. The grass cloaks worn by the peasants and fishermen have been worn here for centuries. And for centuries, Chinese fishermen have used cormorants in their work. The cormorant is a bird especially adept at diving for fish. A ring around the bird's neck keeps it from swallowing the larger, more marketable fish. The birds are allowed to swallow small fish as their own food, but bigger catch are literally coughed up. Where roads are few, goods are commonly transported on boats. Even timber is carefully rafted down the river. sampans and houseboats. It's almost as if the 20th century never happened. But the 20th century did happen and is still happening. Typical of 20th century China are the rural communes that exist throughout the country. The commune is the basic political, agricultural, educational and social unit in China today. People live in compounds on the commune, and each of China's 50,000 communes strives for self-sufficiency. The commune is expected to build its own housing, even make its own building supplies. Wire-cut bricks are produced on many communes. Local production and use saves transportation costs for raw materials and finished products and saves the commune from dependence on distant factories. As long as the product is not too sophisticated and doesn't require materials from far away, the system of local production and use works quite well. Relatively simple technology can often be acquired from nearby communes and, as always in China, skills are passed along from one worker to another. Methods are often primitive and inefficient by Western industrial standards, but there is no shortage of labor in China. The People's Republic of China now produces thousands of tractors and bulldozers each year, 
but could use many times that number. The Yodo, or cave house, is still the primary form of housing built in the Yan'an area, much as it was when Mao hid in one more than 40 years ago. Five or six workers can build one of these dwellings in a week. The cave houses are well suited to an area with little open space and a shortage of building supplies. 70% of the inhabitants live in cave houses. A newly married couple is staying in a yodo. Like all the cave houses, this one will be naturally cool in the summer. In winter, the dwelling's single room is warmed by a heater. Men and women in China are encouraged to marry late. Late marriages are one of the government's ways of checking population growth. Consumer demand is also growing, and this is reflected in the commune store, which stocks a modest variety of much sought after goods. Throughout China, there are faint glimmerings of affluence. Perhaps the government's greatest success has been in the area of medical care. Barefoot doctors are paramedics who have been given brief but intense training in diagnosis, prescription of medicines, even simple surgery. Each commune has its barefoot doctors, generally enough to staff a clinic full time. They learn how to prepare and prescribe traditional Chinese herbal medicines. In 10 years, more than a million barefoot doctors have brought decent medical care to even the most isolated Chinese. Today's Chinese have adequate food and medical care. They also have the opportunity to go to school. In order to bring education within the reach of everyone, schools now teach a simplified version of the very difficult written Chinese language. The number of characters has been reduced, and the characters themselves simplified. Nuances of meaning may have been sacrificed, but everyone will be able to read and write. Chinese school children study some subjects we would find strange, even painful. An anatomical model depicts key acupuncture points. Acupuncture is important in Chinese medicine, not only as an anesthetic, but also as a form of treatment. The children practice what they learn on one another. In China, theory and practice are closely related. A tingling sensation indicates a direct hit. If nothing else, the children become familiar with acupuncture, a form of treatment they will surely encounter again. The soldier workers of each people's commune are a key part of China's plan for military defense. Young men and women form the main body of the civilian soldiers. Once a week, work permitting, they are drilled in the basics of guerrilla warfare. The People's Liberation Army, the largest army in the world, 
would be China's first line of defense. But it was Mao's theory that China would be invincible if every commune in every part of the country had trained soldiers prepared to fight to the death. Their weapons laid aside, the soldiers are farmers and laborers once again. Faith can move mountains, we often hear. In this commune in the Yan'an area, the people have faith in their own determination and hard work. And in this commune, at least, one mountain was cut down to size. With nothing but rocky hills to farm, the villagers had to do something. The process is simple to describe, but incredibly time-consuming and laborious to carry out. First, the peasants eased the steep slopes of the mountain and encircled it with concentric stone fences. One by one, the blocks for the fences were carried and put in place. Only when the retaining walls were completed could the next step begin. Since there was no topsoil on the bare mountain, soil had to be carried in. Some of the soil had to be transported as much as five kilometers before it could be dumped. Much of it was moved one bucket at a time. The result is arable land where before no crop could grow. The mountain has been tamed, and fertile terraced fields stretch as far as the eye can see. Testament to the industry and determination of the Chinese peasant. In the morning, the peasants marched to their fields and paddies as a group. Men and women with their tools and animals and carts. The entire commune is mobilized for work. Today, work is being done in the rice paddies, important work, for without rice, many Chinese would go hungry. The rifles are stacked carefully and are never far away, as the citizen soldiers go about their work. The Chinese first flood their rice paddies to kill off any weeds. Rice is the only cereal that can be planted in water. Planting seedlings instead of seeds gives the rice a head start. In many areas of China, this technique enables farmers to plant and harvest two crops a year. Mechanization aids in parts of the process. But most of the work is done by the people with the help of their animals. Industry and education and medicine have all made great strides under the People's Republic. China's face is changing, but its heart is still the peasant, and its soul is still the land.